Economic Alliance presents the Gulf Coast Growth Show, your show for the coast with the most growth, with your host, Jason Lee and Clint Aiken. All right, we are live, and we are here with Captain Bill Dill over at the Greater Houston Port Bureau today. Uh, and before we get a little further into you know a formal introduction, uh, we're on episode five, yeah. I think. We're epi- wow, that's crazy. Uh-huh. So uh, it's gone uh, past. T- time is flying by, uh, and we're already now starting to plan for our next round of guests for the the next twelve series that we're putting out and looking for sponsorship. So uh, definitely excited about that. Um, this I'm Jason Lee, your host, and I'm with my co-host Clint Aiken. And we are the Gulf Coast Growth Show, your your show for the coast with the most growth. He's just nailed that. That's like extremely difficult no, to do. Now. So no, he's just, now. he's mastered it. Um, before we jump in, we're going to recognize our sponsors for a second, but we're going to give a little gratitude. Uh, I always start out with an attitude of gratitude. I'm actually grateful. Uh, on Friday, uh, I, I know I talked last week about how excited I was to actually have my wife uh, join me uh, and come into town so she could attend. A, I'm an ambassador for a group called Youth for Christ. So I was at their, uh, their, their basic annual banquet. The thing that I'm so most grateful for is, uh, so... When he scheduled the banquet, he had no idea it was Astros Hope opening day. So um, we probably had 50% of the the expected turnout that we had hoped for, right? Because, you know, who's this Jesus guy? We got the Astros, right? So um, uh, it became a pretty uh, complicated situation. But what was really great about it is we, we, we said, hey, we hope we have the exact amount of people doing the exact amount of things for this event. So there was an exact number that needed to be hit. Uh, from a fun perspective, and I got a phone call, got a phone with him yesterday, and uh, even though we were short on people, the power of those people was actually able to hit that number uh, and exceed that number by just an inch, right? We, and so I don't have the number exactly, but he stated it clearly, and he called me yesterday and let me know that they just made it over the, uh, cool. so inside of seven days, they empowered and enthused enough people to go out, and so that organization is going to bring a lot of uh, uh, mentorship into folks and the kids that need help and mentors to help guide them in life and so very excited about that impact so Clint you know I'm, I'm just really grateful I've got, um, I've got some family coming to town this weekend so I'm happy that we've got family coming in but it's also um, honestly had some struggles this week with business um, it's kind of nice that we live in a country where we just we have so much opportunity and I think we take it for granted how much opportunity we have you know mm-hmm. anytime that a business deal doesn't go right or it doesn't go as fast as you think it should all we have to do is pick up the phone and start another one. You know, we don't have to get someone's approval. We can go out there. We can just make it happen. So I love the amount of opportunity we have, and I'm, I'm grateful to be in a country where we have that opportunity. So you're saying you don't need someone's approval to be successful. That's yeah. fantastic. There you go. Yeah. Captain Deal. I'm grateful, obviously, for the health of my family and the love of my family. Um, but I do want to give a shout-out to the guys. Uh, every Friday I meet with a bunch of guys at church in the morning from 6 to 7. And uh, we came up with an idea four years ago to put on a men's Catholic conference. And we do it in the port every year. Awesome. And uh, so a bunch of great guys working to uh, basically promote Christianity and, and we're doing it through this conference and trying to develop it. Wow. Very That's exciting. exciting. Wow. Yeah, it's, it's, it's great stuff. So yeah. I tell you what, let's jump into our sponsors. We'll identify those and talk about our events. And then we'll fire off our, uh, our interview with Captain Dill. Absolutely. So last week we had Turner on, and Turner's been a great sponsor for us. For over 55 years, Turner industry employees across the Gulf Coast and beyond have answered the country's toughest industrial challenges. They provide one solution for your success with industrial construction, maintenance, turnaround, pipe and module fabrication, equipment, rigging, and specialized transportation, and associated specialty services. You can learn more at turner-industries.com. We also are always very grateful for the support of the Industrial Safety Training Council, the ISTC. The Industrial Safety Training Council is proud to support this podcast. ISTC, the nation's leading industrial workforce compliance organization, is committed to the safety of our petrochemical plants, pipelines, and their contractors. You can drop them a line at hashtag IMSafety. And lastly, we want to thank McDonough Engineering Corporation. McDonough Engineering Corporation is a full-service engineering firm specializing in industrial site design including tank terminals, truck loading facilities, and manufacturing and distribution facilities. We are proud supporters of the Economic Alliance, Houston Port Region, and this podcast. You can check out more and learn more about McDonough at mectx.com. So announcements, uh, I know coming up, one of our good media partners is BIC, 
uh, BIC, they've got their uh, crawfish boil coming up at Sylvan Beach. Uh, so you can go to their website, always learn more about that. And then we actually have a breakfast for the Patrick Kim Christian Fellowship this Tuesday. Uh, that starts at 7 a.m. and uh, it's free, it's open to the public. Um, I actually do cook breakfast myself and I'm, I'm pretty proud of myself as a cook. So come and join us if you can make it. Uh, you can go to our website to learn more about that or just reach out to me on LinkedIn. Give me a call. I'd love to get you connected with that. So uh, one of the Petrokin Christian Fellowship breakfasts, um, after it was over, I, I went to Kent Clint and said, hey, do you want to go somewhere and get some real breakfast now? <laughs> and he was like, that was real breakfast. So I was like, no, you know, like a, like a sit down and actually you know, some real food and stuff. And he was like, dude, I cooked that. And I was like, <laughs> awesome, man. Um, so, yeah. I'm full. Yeah, woo, that was good stuff. Um, you want so, to settle. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I literally had uh, my foot, foot in my mouth on that one. So, uh, so Captain Bill, let's turn it over to you. Uh, before we jump into, I think uh, when I even announced the show, I said we're going to do a little port one on one, right? A little education. Right. We got some cool stuff to share with our audience today uh, on the screen and some, just get a little change of pace. Now, not only are you the president, you're a pretty good marketer because uh, when I asked him to come down to where we normally host, he says, oh, you guys got to come down here. And I get it because uh, it's not his first rodeo. He was sharp enough to know, hey, we gotta, we're got to we going to bring the cameras, bring everybody out to see the new facility. So thanks for the tour earlier. Uh, I'm really enthused to see what you guys have done over here. Uh, you're in a great building, great location, uh, great training rooms and some facilities. And I think you do a lot for the, for the, you know, for the region. We're going to talk a little bit about that, but congrats on the new facility. Thank so. You. Uh, so instead, on top of being marketing and the president over here, tell us a little bit about your background and, and what led you to this position. Sure. I uh, was in the Coast Guard 31 years, went to the Coast Guard Academy, uh, graduated, went on ship for a few years, and then uh, did pollution response, inspection of vessels, and things like that, and moved around quite a bit. And uh, my last assignment was here in Houston in charge of the Coast Guard here. So sector Houston, Dallas is the largest command in the Coast Guard. When we got down here, uh, I was considering some jobs on the West Coast and uh, decided that uh, it's best for the family to stay on here. Got out and had been with the Port Bureau for 10 years now. Wow. Congratulations. That's well, awesome. We lucked out um, and we're thankful that you know you, you were able to keep it. So I was I was sharing with the group, I, 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 I knew of Captain Dill, didn't know who he was. And then when I went and saw his picture to share it, I was like, oh. I know that guy. He's he's going to be fantastic because I'd say I, I'd have the pleasure to watch you speak twice, uh, and you're, you have a dynamic presence. So we're excited to have you on the show, sharing a little bit about what you do. So, with that being said, why don't we jump into uh, you know first and port foremost, right? yeah, Port One Hundred and One. What is so? First of all, what is the Port of Houston? How does it work? What's the Port Bureau? Tell us a little bit about it. So okay, well I'll start with the Port Bureau, and then we'll roll into the into the port. Okay. And I don't know if I'm supposed to be looking at the you can camera you can look at me, or, look at the camera, or whatever you want. Right. I don't know what to do with my hands. I just, right. you know, so. <laughs> I understand. So the the, uh, the Port Bureau is basically a trade organization that's been around for 90 years. And uh, basically what, what we focus on is the water. So the companies that need the water or that support companies need the water, we provide, try and provide them information and access to those companies and stuff to try and generate more business for the port. We're about bringing more cargo efficiently and maximizing how the port works. So that's the basics of what we're focused on. As far as the port goes, a lot of people, as I travel around and I explain the port, uh, most ports, like West Coast ports or so, they're, they're naturally made ports. So you pull in and it's a natural harbor, it's steep, it's wide, and things like that. That wasn't the case here with Houston. Houston really is, when I describe the port of Houston, I describe it as the Houston ship channel, or half the Houston ship channel. So, I'll start with describing the use of chip channel. Okay. So when you come into, uh, into the bay, Galveston Bay, through uh, uh, where the ferry goes across at Galveston, okay, from there all the way up to the end of the ship channel, which we call the turning basin, the ships come and we widen that spot for the ships to spin, is 52 miles. Okay? Wow. And when you think about it, uh, the Galveston Bay is only like 10 feet deep, 4 feet deep. And then you come up, and at Morgan's Point, you enter Buffalo Bayou, which is about the same or less. And so basically, our forefathers and, and, and people in front of us thought, you know, what we need to do is dig this out. We need to dig a big ditch in this thing. So you got this 10-foot bay and bayou that they dug this 45-foot deep by 530 feet wide ditch in. Okay. Wow. 
And they tell you that because it wants to be 10 feet again. Right. And we know that right. and stuff. And so every time it rains, we have sediment falling into our dish, which we call the ocean ship channel. And we know to get that out costs about $50 million a year. But the business itself of the channel generates about $400 million a day of business. So it's a great return. Right. 400 a day that's, for 50 that's a year. That's a great decent ROI. Right. So. <laughs> wow, that's insane. So when I'm on the uh, when I'm when I'm out there fishing, and and I or not I'm not on the port because I can't fish there. Right. But there's every once in a while you'll pass those big, giant things and they're just like pumping dirt out right. from they're, it looks like a tube. And then yeah. there's just this dirt just flying into this big giant thing. That's what that is. That's yeah, what the dredge is. It's a it's a suction dredge. It has okay. some cutters on the end. It it kind of kind of hits the mud and kind of scoops it up and then it pumps it out through the pipes all the way to a placement area. Wow. And then we let it dewater there and take the water out and build up the banks and, and, and we keep going forward with oh, that. Wow. So it's a, it's, a, it's a process. I'm originally from Buffalo, New York, and I tell people in, in New York, I didn't realize growing up in the snow, I thought snow was fun until I got older and had to go to work, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but when I was in work, you had to plow the streets to get to work. Uh -huh. It's just a part of doing business. Well, for us, it's dredging the ship channel as part of doing business. And right. people don't realize that infrastructure has to be constantly attended to. And so we're constantly trying to keep our ship channel deep and wide. That's I a love big that. thing. Awesome. So basically, that's the ship channel. Uh, and so the upper half of that, from about Morgan's Point all the way to the turning base, is about half of it, about 25, 26 miles, what we call the port of use. There's one terminal down Bayport, one of the the, the bigger container terminal is down in the bay more. But primarily, that's the port of Houston geographically. So if you understand it, there's a ship channel 52 miles long. About half of it is considered the port. So. Oh, wow. So. Okay. And so when you're talking about uh, the port and, and, and what, uh, I guess, the roles and the responsibilities, you talked a little bit about the Bureau. The Bureau. Yeah. Um, and I know that there's kind of the port authority. I think there's a mul multiple bodies that are kind of involved in that. Who all do we service out here? I mean, tell us about the, the so, economics behind it. Okay. Right. I think that's just enthralling. Right. Right. So, I probably work in about ten different ports around the U.S. Okay. And uh, a lot of them are like conveyor belts in my mind because the box comes in, it goes on a truck and a train, and it's going somewhere. It's an intermodal point. You know, you're transferring to somewhere else. When I got here and I fully understood what we were dealing with here, I realized I had to shift my mindset to basically what the port is really is the largest manufacturing center in the United States. What we're manufacturing is liquids, which is tough for people to get their head around, but basically we're taking oil, we're refining it into refined products, gasoline, diesel uh, type stuff, and then we're taking the other products out of that and making chemicals out of it, or we're taking you know natural gas uh, liquids and we're making chemicals. So basically what we're doing is you have 274 facilities in the port. Wow. And what we're doing is we're taking the carbon molecule and we're breaking it and we're splitting it around and swirling around the port for a couple months. And when it's all done, it falls out as benzene instead of like a car or a piece of furniture. Right. We manufacture benzene or styrene or toluene or whatever. And then we decide like plastics. Does it go right, plastic? It could be one of it. Right. <laughs> right. And then do we decide does it go to a domestic market, if it is, we'll most likely put it on a barge, send it down into the intercoastal waterway and we can move it into the domestic markets in the U.S. Or does it go to a global market? We put it on a ship and we send it outbound to the global markets. So really when you phrase it, it's like the ship channel just kind of augments the manufacturing center. The manufacturing center augments the ship channel because they're two, you know, you gotta, they've got to get the market through the ship channel. Most right. people think, well, maybe it'll go by pipe, train, or truck, or whatever. You can move refined product by pipe, you, oil, gasoline, diesel. There's enough volume that I can put that in a pipe from here to Dallas. I'm not going to put a pipe of styrene from here to Beaumont. It's just too much product, but it fits nicely into a barge, and then we can move it. It'll also, it's a more sophisticated chemical. We can put it on a train or a truck and move it out of here. But we're manufacturing liquids. That's about two thirds of the product. But we also have containers. We have break bulk, which is going to be a lot of uh, petrochemical products like pipe and steel and stuff that supports the petrochemical. We also have bulk commodities like coal and grains and stuff that go through.
Which is a very a lot diverse. Of too, yeah. right? Right. There's That's a something lot that's of, kind of interesting. I, I talk to people, I've, I've had a background a little bit of aggregate, and no one realizes how much of that actually we should out right. of Houston. It's, it's enormous amounts, tons. We are, if, if you look at it as a port, you know, when I would go talk nationally or whatever, and I'm talking to people, and I said, they, well, the port, yeah, it's not LA or New York, which they kind of reflect on the cities as far as that goes. But I look at it and I say, no, it's not. So if I take the number of ships that come into New York, New Jersey, which is the biggest port on the East Coast, mm -hmm. about 4,300 ships a year enter those ports. And I take the busiest port on the West Coast, which is uh, Long Beach, uh, LA, about 4,000 ships. I add them together, we do that in Houston. We do 8,300 ships a year. That's so we great. take the busiest port on the East Coast and West Coast, add them together, and that's what we do. Now New Orleans, mm -hmm. New Orleans is about 6,500 ships. But the, the catch on that is we move 200,000 barges on top of all those ships. So people don't realize that we call that the brown water industry. Brown water and the movement of these push boats and, and, and barges and stuff, it's just key to the whole process because when the stuff is manufactured, you have to get it, in, you have to, get it to market. And a lot of it's going to go out by these barges and they're very integral to our, to our economy here. Wow. So can so, you tell us about some of the future issues that are coming up? I, I want to jump to that, but I think okay. we're nearing a commercial break real quick. Oh, yeah, yeah. sorry. If it's okay, <laughs> I'm I'd, so love excited. To, I'd love to jump into that, but but I'd also like to, we have this on the screen, and since he, he did such a good job putting that together, yeah. I'd like to hit that, because that okay. talks okay. a little bit about the science, and then we'll discuss some of those issues. So good. let's let's nail out our uh, commercial break real quick, and sure. then uh, we'll jump back into that. So our sponsors for the Gulf Coast Growth Show are Industrial Safety Training Council, McDonough Engineering Corporation and Turner Industries, and we're very grateful for their sponsorship because we wouldn't be able to do this one. Um, and for those that are, you know, going to be on the audio, because um, you're not going to get to see the screen if, when you're listening well, to the podcast uh, down that. the future. So yeah, so we'll we'll kind of walk a little bit through it, but just to kind of give you an idea if you're not, even if you're going to be listening to the podcast, it basically looks like one of those things that when you go to the airport, you're trying to figure out what kind of airplane you're about to get on. Right? And you're just staring at it, and there's 50 different flights and 50 different things, and the gates and the, the airline. Uh, we're kind of looking at like one of those, but it's... So well, that's an excellent analogy, okay. and, and, uh, and I'll key off of that. Fantastic. So, so tell us what we have here and how it plays a role in the day-to-day -day activity of what's going on out there. So we're the Marine Exchange for Texas. So we track all the ships that come into Texas from Beaumont to Brownsville and the ports, and we record that information. And we're kind of the honest broker of vessel movement information for the Port of Texas. There's another one in LA, in, in uh, Louisiana, Florida, and things like that. But we have the, the basic franchise for Texas. So in Houston, though, what we did was we wanted to kind of mirror what you said with getting the right information out. Because we knew if we had the right information, uh, people will self-organize. You just got to find the right information. So we, we benchmarked off the uh, airports. We said, oh, an airport like Bush self-organizing 100,000 people a day. We said, How do we do that in the port? Well, the Houston pilots moved the, move all the ships, and we, and we approached them. We said, how do we take your information? You know what's going to happen. How do we take that information and get it out to the, to the port? So what you, what you were describing is what's on the screen here is basically the same type thing. So when you look at it, when you go to the airport, you look up and you go, I'm going to Boston. You see your flight, okay, I got to go to B4, I got to go there at 11 o'clock. So you self organize. The pilot self organizes the fuel, the food, the luggage, all that gets squared away and it's efficiently moved because you know what's going to happen. You can imagine an airport that was ran by a radar sweep. You'd say, hey, a plane's coming in out of east at 200 knots. Is it going to terminal A1 or E10? I don't know. The luggage guy sits there where the lady sits there until it pulls in and then they run over and get your luggage. It's just chaotic. Right. Part. So you can, predictability is what you want. Well, for us, in order to get the control tower information, the pilots provide that. This is actually their dispatch information, how they're assigning their pilots. And to make the, more, the port more efficient, they give this out to us so we can distribute it out to the port so that people can see what's going to happen when. So, so what time does this get out to the port? Port. This is real time. So right now, oh, it's being right updated now. every oh, wow. 21 seconds as far as how it goes. Oh, so wow. if I schedule the next ship, it'll be on there, and you could look at it, and it'll tell you, 
okay, the next ship is going to be the Bao Santos. It's going to start moving at, uh, you know, 1500. It's going to come up the channel. The tug guy knows, uh, you can tell over there in the second column, it'll tell you what tug package we're going to need when that thing starts to get close. So a bigger ship like a container ship might need two big tractor tugs. And when you get further up the channel, there are smaller ships. A brake bulk ship may only need a small tug, and we can fly. So when you look, everything is sort of organized by where the asset is needed, and they can play that out. So wow. all the agent, all the information you would need to know about the ship is on there. So when the ship is coming up, the line handlers, the cargo surveyors, the terminal, all know what's going to happen in the next four hours and how it's going to pull out and further out than that. So. So I think it's just amazing uh, what you just described, and, and, and then we'll kind of shift gears, but I, I think the thing that's most powerful is every single day we get up and we drive on the bridges, we drive right past the water, we look right down at it, you know, and when you walk into an airport, you automatically get a feel that there's a million things going on. There's, you know, you, you understand the dynamics because you see the planes coming in and coming out and the, tr the luggage coming off, and it's, it's like clockwork, right? We don't realize, take that and multiply it, and then throw it on the water, and, and that's basically what's happening. Uh, and you guys are orchestrating all those movies. It's just there, unbelievable. There's a lot of people in the port uh, focused on this and trying to make the port efficient. And one of the things we do out of this is because we have this information is fed into a, a database, and then we are, as an organization, looking at it and trying to improve the efficiency of the port by studying, like, why does it take this long to get to here? Why is this an anomaly compared to what all the other uh, wow. movements are? And trying to work on how do we keep the port efficient because we're, we're, we're competing against other ports and, and you know that you want better, faster, cheaper, but at the same time, we've sort of focused on, we can get better, faster, cheaper by focusing on predictability. So companies will pay for predictability. Like you tell me, I can get into the port in six hours, and, and everything will line up, I, I want to do business with you. If I don't know what's going to happen, and I'm guessing, and, and I get nervous, and, and I may not want to do business with your port. So for, what predictability we're trying to, pays. Right, yeah. predictability, they want better, faster, cheaper, but they'll pay for predictability. I love that, okay. So the future issues question I was asking earlier, that kind of deals, uh, some of this deals with, with some of the concerns, like the two-way traffic, right? Okay. Can you kind so, of sure. a bit more? So what we're seeing is, obviously, Business is just booming for us. And right. So as they build out the, the Permian Basin, Eagle Ford, things like that, our manufacturing center is running full speed. We're manufacturing a lot of plastics in the Olefin plants, and we're moving that down to the container ships, and the container ships are coming in with more boxes and taking out more boxes, and everything is moving forward very rapidly. And so as we go, we just see in the next few years, we see more and more ships coming. Mm -hmm. And because we're probably not going to process a lot of that, we're going to just move that right to global markets. You know, the refineries are operating at 98% efficiency. You know, they're not going to have to build another refinery. It's going to go to a global market somewhere. We got to we got to process that out. So as as we're building that up, when we're looking at like what does the port look like 10 years from now, they're doing a study right now on that. And basically, the the idea is okay. It's a, it's a $10 billion four-year study. And they're kind of coming to a conclusion that they don't need to widen across Galveston Bay for us. Their model is kind of based on the depth of the ship, not on, on width. Well, for us, the way the ships come up and cross the channel, they, they do basically the Texas chicken, which is where they come head on to each other. And then right when they're about a half mile off, they'll give each a little bit of right rudder. And the bow waves will push them aside and then they'll basically tuck right back in. It's kind of like a little leapfrog as they come up. Wow. With a certain dimension, you can't do that anymore. And it's about 1,000 feet. So when we, we know as we go forward, we need a wider channel in order for us to keep going. So Plus the ship's getting a little bit bigger too, the, right? The, well, the ship gets bigger, so now if I go right rudder and I start to go over, I'm still uh, 1,000 feet. I'm further over to the, you know, to the port side than, right. than, than an 800-foot ship is, okay? So we, we got to take that into account. So we are really focused on, uh, last week I was with the Economic Alliance up in, uh, in Washington, D.C. Great visit. There was about uh, 30 visits that we went around with uh, Chad and a lot of economic people talking about, hey, we need a wider channel. 
We need 800 feet. We need to, we need to basically expand because we see a lot ahead for the court, but we need a wider channel. So right. we're really pushing the Army Corps for to do the right thing and give us a wider channel. Wow. Yeah, I was always uh, intrigued by uh, that. You know, you have the you have somebody up here who's responsible for the rivers and. They're trying to get money for the rivers because it's important. And then there's somebody who wants to get money for the port because it's important. And there's somebody who wants to get money. It's, it's just an interesting flow. Uh, and, and so and so, I'm so thankful that we have uh, organizations and committed people like yourself who are out there championing and fighting for those dollars because you know, they, they impact everybody in my, my circle, right? The families, the jobs, the opportunities. The more growth that can come, the more jobs and the more money that can come to the region. So. We, we tell people... No channel, no port, no port, no Houston. Yeah, there you, you go. Know, you need, the golden goose is, the, is that ditch. And, and basically, you know, it sounds bad, but <laughs> no, that I, ship this, channel this funny, brings but... it. Yeah, the, <laughs> the ships bring it. The, the facilities are here because of the channel. Right. And Houston really is thriving because of a lot of that business. One of the things that we were pushing last week with the Economic Alliance was on exports. And basically, if we soaked in by two feet, we got a light boat to ship. That's where the profit comes in, because the, the other feet are basically part of the margin of operating. Okay? And if we have to light load, we can't make any money off it. Well, Saudi Arabia and our competitor ports are not light loading. So it really hurts us on the outbound. And we're, we're saying, you want exports. We do about 13 to 15% of all exports in the United States go out of this port. Wow. And we're like, do you want this to be an efficient way for us to compete in global markets so that we balance out our debt ratio, right? It's really key that we get a deep and wide port because coming inbound, if I'm ordering shirts, socks, and shoes, well, they're coming here no matter what. I just have to pay more, because you know. But on the outbound, they could choose to buy from someone else. Right. So exports really are keyed into a deep wide channel. Yeah, and if you ever take a look at our current debt situation, it'd be important for us to pay attention to that because I think it would make a huge impact on the nation. So it's really critical. Right. Yeah. You're looking at a you know, a return that is a matter of days. Right. You know, if you're generating four to five hundred million dollars of business a day, and you need about a billion dollars to widen it, then you might deal with it. I'm in the wrong business. <laughs> <laughs> I need to open a port <laughs> or a ship channel. Um, hey, so with that, why don't we? Uh, we're getting close to wrapping up, but I'd love to hear a little bit about some of the big things you guys have. Some news, a couple of events and things that you have lined up. Uh, I think we're celebrating something this year, so. Right. Uh, tell us a little bit about that, and then we'll get close to wrapping up. So we're excited because this year is our 90th year of uh, the Greater Houston Port Bureau. Um, and so we have an annual dinner every August, and uh, we're going to be honoring Jim Black, one of the mainstay people in here, uh, CEO of Moran Shipping. Um, so we're going to recognize him at it, but we're going to make it a big party for us to celebrate 90 years of, of basically uh, what we call competitive partners. They're... they're they're all competitors, but we're trying to get them to work together to bring more cargo to the port. I think they call it frenemies now, right? Yeah. They're frenemies. Is that right. <laughs> Frenemy? So, yeah. That's, that's what we're going to be celebrating, um, and we, we're looking forward to that. It's, it's, it's a great time for us to stop and pause and say for 90 years we've been trying to push forward. The success of this port has been phenomenal to recognize that. And kind of, so it's uh, in August. Do we where, do? You guys already have a venue? In yeah, it's at the Bayou Event Center. Okay. Uh, and basically we do that there every year. It's on the south side of, uh, of NRG Stadium on the south side of 610 down in that area. Wow. But if they contact us, we, we have, it's actually the largest maritime dinner in the nation. We get 700 to 800 people come out. And it's basically the, the marine community coming out and getting together and talking to each other and making sure that, you know, we're all trying to push the same way to bring more cargo to Houston make this port successful. That's fantastic. So, so we're not a big uh, alumni guys and we don't talk about a lot on the show, but I know we got a lot of Aggie listeners and stuff like that. So um, I think there's something that you, you <laughs> shared a story earlier. It wasn't on the agenda, but we got to acknowledge it. Yeah, we got that. Big awesome. um, and I know that Chet Burke is going to be jumping up when he hears it, but uh, tell us a little bit about what you're celebrating this weekend. Something uh, pretty significant for you and your family. And, uh, to share with the audience before we wrap up. So my youngest boy, Michael, is a senior at Texas A&M, and uh, he called a couple weeks ago and said, hey, uh, I'm being recognized as a, a Buck Wires recipient. 
and I thought at first it was a uh, scholarship, and I said, well, how much is that worth? And he goes, oh, it's not worth anything. And, and I said, oh, what is it? He goes, I think I get a watch. And I said, okay, and, and I let it go with that. But then I ran into Chad, I knew he was a big uh, XAM guy, and I asked him about it, and he goes, oh, that's a big deal. So I went back and I Googled it and looked it up, and it's basically the, uh, the university recognizes 50 students every year out of the 50,000 who display the spirit and values of Texas a and at the Nagy. Wow. And so he's being That's selected. Cool. And so my wife and I called him back and said, we'll definitely be up there Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> Man, congratulations. Is. So that he, is... he low balled it and low keyed it to us, but uh, when we, <laughs> we figured out what it was, we realized that Kind of a big deal. It's a big deal. Yeah. That's cool. a huge 50 out of 50,000. That's a huge deal. So congratulations yeah. and congratulations right. to Mike. And that's that really, you know, as parents, you know, we'd always tell them, like, you know, we're, we would say this to kids all the time. We're raising strong women and gentlemen. We really want you to be kind and considerate of others in what you do and things like that. So to be recognized for that is, is you know, in his four years there, you can ask him. I've never asked him what his grade for. But right. I said, how are you doing to help other people when you're there? So this is a reflection of how he's doing. Oh, wow. That's awesome. That's awesome. I'm going to, I'm, I heard a couple things. I took notes from you. I won't stick them on the show, but you've given me a lot of those. I'm just in, spending some time with you today. So it's really yeah. been a pleasure uh, getting, getting to know you. And um, as we look to wrap up, we want to remind our audience um, on Fridays. So next weekend, there won't be a show. It's Good Friday. So uh, we're taking off next Friday. Um, and then we'll be back uh, with Rick Torson on the 26th. Uh, and he's going to be talking about leadership development, coaching, uh, taking your people to the next level. So he's a phenomenal guy and right. uh, just a pleasure to be around. Uh, we do want to remind the audience that live on Fridays at the Economic Alliance uh, Facebook page, you can always tune in. And the following Wednesday, uh, we will have the show edited. It's released via the Economic Alliance uh, on LinkedIn. Uh, you guys can tune in, and at that point in time, you can catch today's show. Uh, and we would ask our partners, our friends, our peers. Uh, the whole point of this show is not to have an audience of uh, of listeners that are already aware of these things that are already part of this. The idea is to take it and push it out to your team, to the folks that are sitting at the, the desk and don't realize the huge role that they play in a in a four hundred million dollar a day operation. Uh, because they just put their head down and go to work. We really want to get this out to the workforce and let them get to hear and see some of the great things that they're a part of. So um, I'm thankful to be a part of it. I know we all are. So we really do appreciate you, Clint. Anything you want to add? Yeah, uh, for sure. We definitely want to share um, on social media channels. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube, definitely subscribe to the YouTube. Uh, Mary Salas actually set up a really good page on the Economic Alliance website. So if you want to learn where you can subscribe, depending on what device you are, it's it's all there. It's beautiful. Uh, she did a great job with that. So appreciate her help. Right. And of course, we got to close by thanking our sponsors. Yep. So we want to thank the ISTC, the Industrial Safety Training Council. We want to thank McDonough Engineering Corporation and our great partner and in Turner Industries. And a big thanks to Captain Dill and the I'm Greater safe. Houston Port Bureau today. Uh, you guys tune in on the 26th and have a great weekend. Thanks. Alliance thanks you for tuning in to the Gulf Coast Growth Show. Be sure to subscribe to the YouTube channel and share with your friends.